Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. Today's episode starts by paying tribute to a powerlifting legend. Then Greg shares some bench press tips with us, followed by a discussion on time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. To play us out, Greg answers a listener's question about common mistakes that coaches make when coaching beginners. Finally, we've got a great interview with Dr. Grant Tinsley. Grant is a professor at Texas Tech University, and he sat down with us to talk about some of his research on body composition, physique athletes, and intermittent fasting. As always, thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your host, Eric Trexler. Today, I am joined by a temporary guest host named Greg Knuckles, and as our listeners know, we did, in fact, come out with the first ever fitness podcast, which has garnered us a great deal of attention on the internet. And uh, Greg, you came up with a, a really nice idea to kind of put that newfound attention to use, um, kind of a new service, I guess you'd say. Yeah, so we're we're trying to stay at the cutting edge of the field in terms of the products and services that we provide for our listeners and readers. So a lot of the people in our audience are fitness professionals. One of the toughest things about doing fitness stuff online is accruing an audience in the first place. I think most people would agree to that. Comes easily to some people, but for a lot of people, there's a grind of multiple years just to get enough eyes on your content that you can sell enough coaching, sell enough products just to make ends meet. So we figured, how about we launch a service that will fast track that process for online content producers? So when you look around, there are a multitude of people whose entire online business model revolves around generating controversy. They call people out, they just generally start a stink, and that's how they keep eyes on their content. And if you have been paying attention to that, you'll know that drama works best when there's multiple parties involved. If person A calls person B out and person B uh, fires back, then that gets both of the audiences involved. There's some some cross-pollination going on. That's when fitness industry beef is at its most effective. However, most people are a little bit too agreeable to initiate beef with other content producers online. And it's hard to know if you call someone out, are they going to take the bait? Is it going to end up being a beneficial uh, beef transaction, as it were? So we decided we would launch a service where you can sign up for the low, low price of $199.99 per month. Uh, we Which will... is less than $200. Correct. Uh, very much less. We will pair you with someone else who we think would be ideal for you to start beef with. They will also be paired with you. You guys can then exchange contact information, discuss your strategy, decide what you want to call each other out on, exactly what shots you're going to take. Then you can initiate your online beef. That'll get a lot of eyes on your content. If it's messy enough, uh, it, it theoretically could go viral. And that's the goal here. So that's the basic level of our service. If you're willing to upgrade to $499.99 per month... You can, Which is less than $500. Correct. Very much so. You can actually start beef with us directly. Uh, we have, obviously, the first fitness podcast. We have many millions of downloads per month. That will give you access to a large and one might even say burgeoning audience uh, w- with whom you can showcase your beefing ability. Because that seems to be the primary skill set that actually matters in the fitness industry these days. So, uh, yeah, we we just figured, um, you know, you give us your time every week to listen to our podcast. We want to give back to you with this service that will help you grow your online following uh, through the the time-tested strategy of talking shit on social media in the most efficient and effective way possible. Yeah, I mean, right now it looks like the big thing is a lot of people are trying to get hired to coach people how to be fitness coaches, but they're doing a bunch of boring stuff. They're talking about like advertising and funnels and email lists and stuff. That stuff's so boring. Yeah, this will make sure that people see some some level of your personality. Anyone can get out there and say, oh, look, I'm strong. I have good abs. I can be a fitness coach. But that doesn't that doesn't show the audience your personality, which is ultimately what people are going to connect with. 
What does let people see your personality really puts your best foot forward, or at least a foot forward. Talking a bunch of shit online. That is that is how you do it these days. You may not like it, but that is what peak business looks like. Absolutely. Now, normally, on a normal episode, now we would do feats of strength, but uh, unfortunately, there was uh, we lost a legend in, in the strength world. So, um, Greg, why don't you give us an update on that? Yeah, so um, changing gears super hard. Uh, Gene Rishlack died this past week, uh, or probably about two weeks ago by the time you're listening to this. Um, a lot of people have already said a lot of words about him. We probably wouldn't really be able to add to that all that much. I didn't have a personal relationship with him. I don't believe Eric did either. Um, but what I will say is that this isn't just you know, j- just being polite to someone because they died. I legitimately did not ever hear anyone say anything bad about Gene. Uh, didn't hear anyone say anything bad about how he ran his meets. He was the founder of the RPS. And that is actually pretty noteworthy because he was probably biggest in the era of powerlifting that was probably the most toxic. Uh, everyone just constantly talking shit about everyone else in powerlifting. Never heard anyone say anything bad about Gene, uh, which is notable because he was one of the most visible powerlifters of his era. He was the first guy to bench over a thousand equipped um, back in 2004, I believe. And he he looms large in my mind uh, in, in terms of my own personal powerlifting history. Because he was the bench record holder when I got into the sport. Um, so he was, like, looking up to his numbers is one of the first things I remember doing as a powerlifter. Um, but yeah, great lifter. By all accounts I've heard, great guy, great meat director. Um, so yeah, the, the powerlifting community lost, uh, lost a pillar today, or recently. Yeah, and it's tough on our show because we spend our time on this show either talking about something stupid or trivial. You know, we joke around a lot. We talk about things that are like, hey, how do you bench press more? Uh, So it's hard to put things on the show that actually deserve a lot of gravity and kind of a solemn attitude. So um, a very genuine, heartfelt rest in peace. Um, In the interest of the feats of strength segment in general, kind of like in memoriam, uh, do we have any of his like top lifting numbers of all time on hand? Yeah, so he um, he was the first person to bench over a thousand equipped. Um, Scott Mendelson took his record in two thousand and eight, I believe, um, with or t- two thousand and six with a thousand and eight pound bench, and then Gene took the record back about a year later with a thousand and ten. And I believe that may have been the most he did in competition. I, I think he hung it up after that um, and started running his federation and being a meat promoter full time after that. Uh, he also, a lot of people don't know this, um, as a as someone primarily known as a bench specialist, Gene also earlier in his career was uh, a three lift power lifter as well. He also squatted over a thousand in gear. Back back in the era of multiply where pretty good depth was actually enforced. Um, so yeah, he, he had a he had a quite legit looking thousand pound multiply squad as well. Uh, so not just a big bencher, really good all around lifter, um, which obviously matters dramatically less than the legacy he left with the sport as a person and a meat director. Um, but yeah, he he was not just a great bencher, but but a pretty good all around lifter as well. Yeah, great lifter, great guy, big loss for powerlifting as a community. So, switching gears, um, we have a segment on the show called Coach's Corner, where we focus on some applied tips that you can use in your own training or with your clients that you coach. Um, and today, Greg has a couple of tips for the bench press. Yeah, in, in honor of Gene, we figured it was only fitting that the, that the coaching tips today were bench press related. So um, the first one is super basic. The second one sounds weird, but it is worth experimenting with. So tip number one, 
Um, this, so you're going to hear it. You're going to think that sounds so basic. It's stupid, but just give it a shot. It tends to not necessarily make someone have perfect bench press form, but as long as someone's setup is pretty decent, um, they can get a tight arch, get decent leg drive. Like as, as long as everything from the shoulders down works pretty well for their bench press, this tends to clean up the rest. Just squeezing the bar as hard as you possibly can irons out a lot of the inefficiencies people have with their bench press technique. If you, if you conscious, so you don't have to squeeze the bar on bench. Uh, it will sit in your hands due to gravity, and you don't particularly have to squeeze it hard. So a lot of people don't. Um, and when you see, when you see most really elite level benchers. There's virtually no wasted movement. Everything looks tight, smooth, locked in. But kind of a level down, you can see people bend, still bench pretty solid weights, but everything just looks a little bit shakier and like they're in a little bit less control of the load. Um, the The lines the bar takes isn't as clean. Maybe their elbows kind of wobble a little bit instead of just very smoothly like locking out the way they're supposed to so just squeezing the bar as hard as possible will help you create more tension in your upper body generally help give people a, a cleaner bar path and just stay tighter and waste less movement in the bench press um and and that like i said it sounds really basic and dumb but i've seen that very simple cue clean up a lot of technical errors of people who more or less have the movement down, but still just kind of seem shaky and not completely in control of the movement. Okay, and uh, the second tip I have is for people who have lockout problems in the bench press. So most people, if they're going to fail a bench press, they're going to fail it kind of in the mid-range of the lift or slightly below the midpoint of the lift. There are some people, however, who very consistently fail at lockout. They'll get the bar, you know, 95% of the way up, but they just can't finish locking out their elbows, which honestly makes no sense just from a pure tricep strength perspective. And, and oftentimes when people have lockout issues, they'll just hammer tricep work and it doesn't actually go anywhere and doesn't fix much for them. Um... And something I found that helps a lot, and obviously you can't do this on rep work, but maybe just on the last rep of a set, or if you're going for a one rep max, if you're almost there at lockout and the bar just won't go up that last inch or two for you, something that helps a lot is is what I call falling into the bench, um, kind of letting letting your arch go and letting your scapula protract. I found that that helps a lot of people finish locking out uh, the bench press if they fail right there at the very, very top. The reason why I think that is, is um, so your humerus articulates with your scapula or your scapulae. And so when your scapula are super, super retracted and you're almost at lockout, you're, you're, you're to a point where you're in a pretty decent amount of uh, horizontal adduction at that point. And if you just let your scapulae protract, you don't really have to change the angle of your shoulder all that much. Like you don't have to do further horizontal adduction. Um, but basically if you can just hold the bar where it is and fall like two inches into the bench, it locks out for you. I think it may have something to do with scapulohumeral rhythm. So essentially, if you weren't bench pressing, um, like, you know, if you were, say, throwing a punch, when your fist is cocked back at your shoulder, your scapulae are, or your scapula is probably going to be pretty protracted. And then when you're nearing full extension and you're about to make contact with the other person's face, your scapula is probably going to be pretty protracted. Uh, just to reiterate, retracted when the when you're pulling the punch back and then protracted. Did I say protracted? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you're pulling the punch back, scapula retracted. When you're about to actually make contact, scapula protracted. Like that's 
that's the way movements like that would tend to work uh, if your scapula aren't pinned into a bench press. So I think I think that may be what's doing it for you. Um, when you're near lockout in a bench press, if you were, say, doing something like a push-up, um, your scapula would just naturally protract as you go through that range of motion. And so, you know, maybe that's what does it. I... I'm not saying for sure that is the mechanism, but I've seen that be very, very helpful to a lot of people who have that specific lockout problem. So I'm not talking about someone who can clear the mid-range and eventually fails on the bench, you know, four inches from lockout. I'm talking about the type of person who, if they miss a bench press rep, it's always like just the last inch or two before lockout. Um, So falling into the bench, letting your arch collapse a little bit, and protracting your shoulders... Um, helps those people a lot. One th- one note that I'll make is a lot of people hear that and, and they think, oh, well, I retract my scapula to protect my shoulders when I bench. Protracting, that sounds super dangerous. I don't want to do that. The whole point of retracting your scapula is to protect your shoulders at the bottom of the rep. So if you're protracting at the top, y- your shoulders aren't at very much risk in that position in the first place. So You know, I'm not talking about doing all of your reps with your scapula protracted. I'm talking about just the very last rep of maybe a rep max set or when going for a max, just at the very top, letting your your scapula protract, your arch collapse, and basically not trying to press the bar any further, but hold it in that position and fall into the bench about an inch or two to, to complete the lockout. And at that point, since it's happening at the end of the lift, it's basically you've gotten everything you needed out of that upper back tightness for that rep. You can fall back into the bench. You're either going to get it or you're not at that point. Now I I did have one question about your first bench tip about squeezing the bar. Now, sometimes when I have wrist or hand issues, Mm -hmm. um, I will transition to a false grip. Mm -hmm. Some people call it a suicide grip. Um, can you still apply that with the false grip or do, do you generally advise against the false grip in general? I'm actually glad you asked about that um, because that is something I meant to mention. You don't have to say actually. I ask good questions sometimes. Eh, well, maybe. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, but no, that is actually something that I meant to mention and forgot to. Um, So another question that I get pretty frequently is how do I keep my wrists from cocking back when I bench press? If you just squeeze the shit out of the bar, it generally will keep your wrists from cocking back uh, very much. So your, um, your finger flexors and like your hand flexors and your wrist flexors share a common tendon. They share the same, uh, origin. And so when you, if you're listening to this, just try this really quick. It won't be super obvious if there are people around, but cock your wrist back, uh, as far as you can. And then from that position, make the tightest fist you can possibly make that is going to decock your wrist and bring it not maybe completely back to neutral, but back towards a neutral position. Um, so yeah, people who have issues with their wrist cocking when they bench, squeezing the ever-loving crap out of the bar helps pretty substantially with that. And so to, to your question, Eric, um, people have wrist issues when they bench for possibly a couple different reasons. Um, a lot of them do just relate to their wrist cocking back a lot when they bench. And so I don't necessarily think you could squeeze as hard with a false grip, but if you have just a normal grip and squeeze really hard, that may get rid of the need for a false grip. Um, the other, the other potential reason why someone may have wrist discomfort is they may have medial wrist discomfort, um, or I, I guess from anatomical position, that would be lateral wrist discomfort. But uh, on on the thumb side of yeah, your on the wrist, radial side, yeah. yeah. If you're if you're taking a really wide grip on the bar, um, you can get some discomfort on the thumb side of your wrist if you're pinching a tendon. Squeezing the bar super hard probably isn't going to help much with that. And people who take a false grip that allows them to shift more towards almost like a pseudo neutral grip. Um, probably the false grip would, would still be a, a better call there. But yeah, if you're maybe getting some wrist discomfort because because your wrists are cocking back a lot when you bench, just squeezing the bar really hard helps a lot with that issue as well. 
Now, for today's episode, we have a really good interview with Grant Tinsley. He is a professor at Texas Tech University, and he's done a lot of the really cool applied work on intermittent fasting. And so because we have his interview today, we wanted to take a little look at kind of the history of intermittent fasting, what the studies have shown us so far, and then we want to talk about his most recent study, which actually came out this very month. Um, so before we get into the research on it, Greg, you've been in the industry a hell of a lot longer than I have. Um, I basically just kind of checked out for a minute there and just <laughs> lived in a basement lab, <laughs> didn't, yep. didn't pay attention. Um, so can you give a little background of the the fitness industry's history with intermittent fasting? Yeah, so th- this probably won't be a complete history um, for that. Eric Helms would probably be the guy to talk to. He's yeah. he's more like the iron sport historian. But in terms of the recent history of intermittent fasting in the fitness industry, um Several years ago, so I don't know, maybe eight, ten years ago, um, the three people who were really promoting intermittent fasting a lot were Martin Birkin uh, at LeanGains.com, Brad Pilon. Uh, I think his website was called EatStopEat.com. I, I know the book he sold was called Eat Stop Eat, and Ori Hoffmeckler uh, of The Warrior Diet. Um And I'm sure that there were people promoting intermittent fasting prior to them, but basically the fitness industry prior to that was almost synonymous with the bodybuilding industry. Um, And for, for like a good spicy 20 years or so, the bodybuilding practice was, you know, you need to eat 37 meals a day, space them out by at most 20 minutes. Um, you know, basically you, you want to be putting something in your face at all times. And so I'm sure that there were, you know, prophets crying out in the wilderness saying, Hey, you don't actually have to eat all like constantly, but Birkin, Brad Pilon and Ori Hoffmeckler were the first people that I remember being able to cut through that noise and make what many people found to be a persuasive case for not having to live out of Tupperware. Uh, the Burkan approach um, was every day having a 16-hour fasting period and an 8-hour feeding window, which basically just equated to skipping breakfast. Um, Brad Pilon's Eat, Stop, Eat approach was essentially to eat normally most days and then once or twice per week having 24-hour fasts, where basically you would fast from dinner one day until dinner the next day. Um and then just eat normally otherwise. And Ori Hoffmeckler's approach was similar to Burkan's approach, but instead of uh, an 18 hour fast or a 16 hour fast and eight hour feeding window, it was a 20 hour fast and a four hour feeding window. Uh, but other than that, the, the general principles were pretty similar. Um, <laughs> so those were the people promoting intermittent fasting. I should note that there were a lot of people into fitness who, at least some of the time, were doing intermittent fasting forever. Uh, And those were Muslims who were into lifting, who during Ramadan take a very reverse intermittent fasting approach, where rather than skipping breakfast or breakfast and lunch, essentially they would eat a big dinner, maybe a big breakfast, depending when they got up, and then fast throughout the day. Um, So depending on how you define terms here, you may see that as more of a time-restricted feeding approach than intermittent fasting. Those two terms are effectively synonymous these days. It, it, it does, uh, Ramadan brings such a interesting challenge. Uh, I, I know somebody who was doing the sport nutrition for a very high-level national soccer team. Mm-hmm. And uh, the majority, if not all of the athletes, uh, were Muslim Mm -hmm. and it was, it was such a cool look at like how to get creative with sport nutrition of trying Mm -hmm. to navigate that as a practitioner, um, during a competitive season. It's the water that gets you. Yeah. Yeah. The the water. Yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so I mean, before Burkan and Pilon and Hoffmeckler were promoting it, like there were obviously 
probably millions of people into fitness who did at least occasionally intermittent fast. Yeah. Um, so th- those were the guys that really got the ball rolling. Um, these days, uh, Andy Morgan, I think, has become more synonymous with intermittent fasting on RipBody.com, even though he doesn't write about it quite as much anymore. Um, let's see. Greg O'Gallagher, uh, Kino Body, is, is probably the person who, who maybe not our audience would know the best, but probably just in fitness generally people would these days associate the most with intermittent fasting um because of his what was it like the real bruce wayne youtube ads that he ran very like cinematic youtube ads yeah um and then someone who who kind of flies under the radar but uh who whose work on intermittent fasting i think warrants a read is uh boyan kostevsky um he used to run the site liftheavy.net I believe that site has gone belly up, um, and he works for a company called, I believe, Lambda Fitness or Lambda Training these days, um, but he wrote, oh man, he wrote like an 80,000 word, essentially book on all of the human and animal research on intermittent fasting that had been published up to 2012. Um, the, the He published it in 2012. Um, I I checked the site prior to us starting recording, and he said he's working on an update um, that hopefully should be out at some point in 2019. But even what he wrote in 2012 is still one of the more comprehensive things about intermittent fasting that I've read. Um, So yeah, that's that's kind of how we got to now in in intermittent fasting in the fitness industry. And in the one of the things that's really challenging with intermittent fasting when you start looking at the research side of things is kind of a big hang up when it comes to terminology Mm -hmm. so if you look up intermittent fasting research you're probably going to find something that does not approximate what you had in mind it's typically like alternate day fasting right correct yeah so um in the research world time restricted feeding with you know the idea of only having like an eight hour feeding window or something like that. Um, They call it time restricted feeding in the research literature because they kind of got beat to the punch when it comes to using the term intermittent fasting. The, the earlier research that kind of grabbed that term really looked at very different approaches than, than a shortened daily feeding window. So that usually took one of a few, uh, formats when we talk about intermittent fasting in the research so uh the simplest one is just alternate day fasting you eat one day you don't eat the next and so on and so forth uh other study protocols have done like a two day like a 48 hour fast that goes somewhere in the week and it's just a weekly 48 hour fast um a third approach that's kind of common in the research is having two 24 hour fasts basically placed somewhere within the week that's what i think brad pilon based his approach on yeah yeah so if you ask someone in the fitness industry what is intermittent fasting they're going to tell you oh you only eat for eight hours a day or something like that Mm -hmm. i I think most people would would give you that definition yeah so the only reason i bring that up is if you look at the literature you'll have to keep your eyes peeled for time restricted feeding rather than just intermittent fasting and you really have to look at what exactly they mean Mm -hmm. when they're describing that intervention Now, a lot of the studies on these research approaches of intermittent fasting, of taking a full day or two days or every other day of complete fasting, um, those studies are usually carried out in overweight or obese people. They're usually not engaged in exercise training uh, of any type. And generally speaking, those studies are oriented toward looking at fat loss. That's pretty much the name of the game. Um, There have been enough of those studies that there are actually, I believe, at least three meta-analyses that have been published kind of summarizing uh, the entire body of literature. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, what those meta-analyses show with that approach is it works better than nothing, which is good, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't really work better than just a normal run-of-the-mill caloric deficit. So in terms of the fat loss outcomes and the, or the general weight loss outcomes, 
It's a completely suitable way to lose weight, but it doesn't seem to confer much of much of an advantage compared to a more moderate, just normal everyday caloric deficit. Yeah, I, I think I think one of those meta analyses reported maybe slightly better fat loss, and one of them reported maybe slightly better lean mass retention. Uh, but when you actually dig into it, the actual magnitudes of those effects were pretty small. Yeah, to the point that. Well, it's statistically significant, but who actually cares? Right, yeah. Yeah. I remember, like, one time back in the day, I was looking at a study on, like, maybe CLA, mm-hmm. the supplement, and it was for fat loss. Oh, that's a that's a blast from the past. Yeah, yeah. I, I was looking at a study, and that, if, that was all over T Nation's front page in, like, 2009. Yeah, yeah. That, that's when I was really into the Cause supplement. Because it, it gets mice shredded. So it, if, mice get, yeah. So, of course, it gets human shredded. <laughs> right. But I remember I saw this study that people were like, finally, the definitive proof that it helps with fat loss. And it was like, you had to take it for like 120 days. Mm -hmm. Like, God knows how much money you spent on those pills. And after that entire span of time, it was like an extra 0.8 kilograms of fat loss. And it's like, (sighs) dude, just eat like three less bites of food a day. (laughs) Yeah. And save like 100 bucks on pills and you're good. That That's honestly wild to me because... You can you can express that in terms of how much is each pound of fat loss worth to you, and so that's like an additional pound and a half of fat loss. Right. And if you're talking 120 days, you know that's probably four. And I, I'm I'm going off memory, which my memory sucks, but it was something along I'm, those lines. I'm just assuming that you remembered correctly. Okay. Very dangerous big, assumption. Biggest, but... Big assumption. Hard <laughs> caveat. Yeah. So I remember bottles of CLA pills, like a monthly supply would be about 20, 25 bucks. So let's say you're spending $80 over those four months for an extra pound and a half of fat loss. You're essentially saying each extra pound of fat loss is worth 50 bucks to you. Right. That's wild. Bad bet. And again, I want to be very clear. Greg's, uh, these are essentially arbitrary numbers because my memory is trash. But the... the <laughs> The general concept was it was a long ass study. The magnitude was super tiny, and it, it the the numbers just didn't work. It's like okay, great. So you're paying a ton of money over a ton of time mm-hmm. for a few hundred grams of fat mass lost. Yeah, just not worth it. But anyway, um, there are now studies emerging that look at the more fitness industry kind of approach, which we'll call time restricted feeding. So the idea is. You're still eating every day, but you're restricting the time within the day that you're eating meals. Usually it's going to be like an eight hour feeding window, give or take. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, a couple of the early studies, there were a couple, one was by Grant Tinsley, uh, his first study on the topic, another by Gill et al. Um, There are a couple, these, these studies basically opted not to match for caloric intake. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. Um, Now, what they found um, was that essentially time-restricted feeding is a very nice way to indirectly reduce your caloric intake. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these were completely suitable approaches for weight loss and fat loss, um, but that's not a magic effect, right? It's like if you happen to restrict your, your time window of feeding, you generally tend to eat a little bit less, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I remember when, I, I don't remember as much chatter about the Gill study, but I, I remember when Grant's study was published, so many people jumped on it, and they were like, oh, this is trash research. They didn't even match calorie intake. And it's like, dude, most of the people promoting intermittent fasting say that it's an easy way to consume fewer calories because you're eating sometimes fewer times and just generally spending less of the day thinking about food like it 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 was some people were promoting it as magic via growth hormone which i don't think they fully understand um but yeah most of the people promoting it were were just saying hey this is an easy way to naturally consume fewer calories or to be less hungry while consuming fewer calories so he does a study finds oh lo and behold people consume less calories people are like ah they didn't match calorie intake fucking stupid like yeah yeah whatever because i mean that's that's what he was looking for yeah 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 now the middle ground is where it sucks 
So you you either take the approach and say we're not going to match calories because that's part of the magic here Mm -hmm. is the satiety and the lower caloric intake. The other approach is we're going to very strictly match calories Mm -hmm. and see if there's any physiological magic going on. The worst of both worlds is let's try to match them, but in free living subjects with self-reported nutrition intake Mm -hmm. Um, because it gives you the guise of the idea that that caloric intake was controlled, but realistically, it probably wasn't. Yeah. And so that that's where another study uh, by Morrow et al. kind of fell in the middle there. And it's, it's not to discredit their work or to bash them for it, but it really was kind of right in that middle ground of we're going to try to control it, but not with enough rigor to feel confident about it. Mm-hmm. And so the results really kind of fell in line with exactly what you would expect. So the control group gained 0.2 kilograms over the eight-week study. Um, the, the time restricted feeding group lost about a kilogram. And when you start digging through the paper, you start to see like, there's probably a good likelihood that they just ate probably a little bit less. Yeah. And and that's kind of, kind of what happened. Um, now the other end of that spectrum is a study by Stout Sutton. Oh, so Stout did a little had a little bit more rigorous control um, in terms of the caloric intake. What they did was they kind of met them halfway. So it wasn't com- completely free living subjects. They gave the subjects dinner and they provided them mm. packed breakfast and lunch. Um, but one of the problems was the subjects that were doing the time restricted feeding, um, they kind of struggled to finish their dinners mm-hmm. when, when they were being supervised. So it, it is halfway between like hey live in the metabolic ward for the whole study it was like why don't you come by for dinner we'll pack you up a goodie bag and you take that home for your other meals Mm -hmm. um but but one of the issues was the time restricted feeding group because of the satiety effect uh, of staggering meal intake that way they actually were really struggling to finish their dinners Mm -hmm. and so it it probably confounded the results a little bit again only if you're concerned with finding some kind of magic when calories are matched Mm -hmm. in practical terms that's still a win you know it's like yeah you're you're on a weight loss diet um or or at least like a small weight loss diet they weren't like shedding weight but you could barely get your food in because of this meal timing strategy like yeah if fat loss is a goal then that's a really nice thing to happen Mm -hmm. so what happened was the subjects when they were in that time restricted uh feeding intervention they lost 1.4 kilograms uh, over the eight-week intervention but they did consume 65 fewer calories per day Um, so the numbers don't completely add up um, but but those 65 fewer calories per day i believe is based mostly on their inability to finish dinner Mm -hmm. i I would imagine there's some possibility that some of the non-supervised meals might have also had some unaccounted for uh, caloric shortcomings mm-hmm. in the time restricted feeding group, um, but in any case, uh, you know it it was it was a slight benefit, but again, it really looks like the satiety is, is really what is driving the effect of, of these different intermittent fasting interventions. Mm-hmm. Now, there was a study by Sutton et al. that was very well controlled, so every single meal was prepared by the laboratory and consumed in the lab under direct supervision, and they used a crossover design, which meant that every subject served as their own control, uh, which is in in any kind of physiology study is a really nice thing because you don't have to worry about all the million things that could differ between the people in that group and the other group just Mm -hmm. at random. So what they were trying to do um, was actually keep them at their normal body weight. So, So they were adjusting the caloric intake they, they tried to keep it matched so that over these five-week feeding periods, they would just stay weight stable. They wanted to look at the effects of shifting these feeding windows in the absence of fat loss. Um, and basically what happened was when they tried to make that work, and, and theoretically you would think if there's no magic going on, they would both kind of stay weight stable during the intervention. What happened was uh, the time-restricted feeding group was did end up half a kilogram lighter or when 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 the subjects did the time restricted restricted feeding intervention compared to the other one Mm -hmm. Uh, because it wasn't two different groups it was the same people yeah Yeah. but um 
they were half a kilogram lighter after the time-restricted feeding intervention, uh, but the authors basically said we could probably attribute that to just glycogen storage based on when we did the measurements and when their last meal was. Yeah. Um, yeah. So generally speaking, when you look at the time-restricted time restricted feeding literature, I think it's safe to say that if you're a person who struggles with satiety or struggles with overeating, I think this is a damn good strategy to try to curb that. Now, the thing where the place where it gets tricky is if calories are equal, is a time restricted feeding intervention going to help you lose more fat than a normal meal distribution? I'm not convinced of that yet. And one of the reasons I'm not convinced of that yet is because no one has really put forward a really solid mechanism and mm-hmm. actually provided evidence for that. Um, so, People have said, well, maybe it affects resting energy expenditure or total energy expenditure, but the literature doesn't really consistently show that. Um, some of the researchers have suggested maybe um, adiponectin is playing a role there, but again, very inconsistent in the literature. So no one has really showed a study where there's a clear benefit of the time-restricted feeding in the absence of just eating fewer calories. And no one has really shown a real airtight, solid mechanism that would suggest why there would be some meaningful effect there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... um, So when we talk about something like, say, hypertrophy uh, or strength gains, there's a fair amount of wishy-washiness there just because a lot of that depends on your genetics, just generally how well you respond to training but when you're talking about uh, weight loss or fat loss or, or when you're talking about uh, weight change and body composition change, then you're moving into the range. Uh, you're moving into the realm of dealing with pretty straightforward physics and things that are understood quite well. And so if you're if you know you're consuming the exact same amount of calories, uh, if you're expecting to lose more fat, one of two things can be happening. Either energy expenditure is increasing, like you said, and there's not evidence for that, or um, you're you're having maybe like a shift in respiratory exchange ratio where you're biasing fat burning, but there burning more fat is going to be, it has to be offset by using less lean mass. And so essentially, if you want to make an argument for something being better for fat loss, you need a co-argument for that same thing being better for gaining or retaining lean mass more effectively. Um, and, and like you said, there's to this point not been a plausible mechanism for that other than, oh, maybe people lose a little more fat because they actually end up consuming a little bit less. Yeah. And again, that's not a knock on the intervention. That's a damn good intervention. You know, it makes you eat less. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Um, w- one other mechanism that's been thrown out, I just don't want to omit it in the interest of completeness, but one group of researchers suggested that um, during the fasting period, there's an efflux of free fatty acids from fat cells. They were thinking that might increase gluconeogenesis, which is a energetically fairly inefficient means of creating uh, ATP or creating carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Um, But that just doesn't mesh up well with the studies that actually directly measure different components of energy expenditure. You know, if if there was this inefficiency, theoretically, you'd be able to figure that out. Yeah, and it's not just that. That would also still show up as energy expenditure because when, when you're talking about something not being metabolically efficient, you're talking about losing energy as heat during some right. conversion process. So, yeah, if you're saying that, you know, you're getting a lot of gluconeogenesis and that's metabolically inefficient and that causes greater fat loss, that would have to show up as a measurable increase in energy expenditure, which it doesn't. Exactly. Now, the question that comes up with a lot of people that are into fitness is... You know, with meal frequency, you alluded to this. Back in the day, every bodybuilder carried around like eight things of Tupperware. You had to eat every couple hours to keep your metabolism revved up. Um, 
substantial research has shown that to be a total myth. It's just not. It's just not how it is. Um, the meal timing or the meal frequency conversation then shifted toward essentially how do we maintain muscle protein balance? And then people were, were less worried about frequent meals to keep their metabolic rate up, but more worried about how do I make sure I'm initiating spikes in muscle protein synthesis throughout the day? And the idea was, you know, based on some research, we see that you, you give a, a, a solid bolus of, of protein. When I say solid, I mean sizable, not literally mm-hmm. solid. But you give a bolus of protein, you increase protein synthesis for a certain amount of time. In the immediate period following that, there's what they call the refractory period, where another bolus of protein will not necessarily summate or give an additional stimulus for protein synthesis. So the idea was... You want to have multiple spikes throughout the day, but they can't be too close together. So you want to spread them evenly. And so what that, what most people would, would recommend from that viewpoint would be anywhere between three to six, three to five, three to six equally spaced meals from the moment you wake up to the, basically before you go to bed, you want to space them as much as you can and still get several in while having at least like three ish hours between them. Now, that's an approach that is totally at odds with time-restricted feeding. And so a lot of people have said, well, this time-restricted feeding seems to be great for enhancing satiety, which could help me stay leaner and feel more satisfied on a calorie-restricted diet. But am I going to sacrifice muscle gains or am I going to lose muscle from implementing that strategy? That's the question that's been on a lot of people's minds, I, I think, for for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And that's where Grant Tinsley's new study comes into play. So this is a study in resistance trained females. They were on a time restricted feeding protocol where they had all their meals within an eight hour period. And they were being compared to a control group that was just eating their normal schedule. And throughout this diet protocol, they were doing eight weeks of resistance training. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into all the details about exactly what they did. But uh, the good news is, If you look in the September 2019 issue of Mass, I am going to do a very, very deep, thorough review of this study. I'm going to get into all the details of exactly what they did, exactly what they found, and exactly what that means for you. Uh, But for today's podcast, I'm just going to very briefly summarize the findings, which essentially showed that the feeding schedule did not meaningfully influence the adaptations to resistance training when it came to performance or body composition. And normally with, with a study outcomes, a study where the outcomes are generally null and there's no difference between groups, you go, oh, it didn't work. In this case, I think a lot of people who advocate for time-restrictive feeding um, probably had a sigh of relief because the big concern was, are you missing out on hypertrophy or are you going to fail to retain lean mass by having this restricted feeding window? So in this case, null results are actually pretty all right when it comes to the time restricted versus the normal feeding window. So when we talk about meal timing, I think the general recommendation I always give people, like my my clients that I coach, I say it'd be great if you had at least three protein containing meals. If you space them throughout the day, great, but, but we need three of them and preferably they'll be at least a few hours apart from each other. I think three is a nice minimum number. If you had to, is that going to be the end of your goals with that diet or training program? Probably not. It's not the end of the world. You'll be fine. But this study kind of lends a little bit of confidence to people who are worried about the idea that if you don't have protein upon waking and then three more times throughout the day and then right before bed, you can still uh, have similar adaptations to a, to a resistance training program. Yeah. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, there was a paper that came out this month um, by Bin Naharudin et al. Sure. It's close. Uh, it's called Breakfast Omission Reduces Subsequent Resistance Exercise Performance. And so what they did was they looked... God, spoiler alert. I know, right in the title. Um, but what they did was pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, after an overnight fast... Uh, They either gave a breakfast or they just had them drink some water, did resistance training. 
And what they found was that omitting breakfast in this case, in people who normally ate breakfast, uh, performance was significantly impaired by the lack of breakfast. We need to put an alert out to these scientists where we as lowly podcasters are trying to, as the kids say, drop knowledge bombs on our listeners. And part of that involves us being able to be the ones uh, delivering information to the listeners. And when you give the game away in the title of your paper, that's that's taking that's taking food out of the mouths of hardworking podcasters everywhere, which I'll note now there are literally dozens of after we blaze this trail. Mm-hmm. I hear you, man. So w- with with these two different studies kind of both coming out this month, they kind of paint a little picture for you in terms of what you can get away with and what probably isn't a great idea. Um, I, I would say that if you want to do intermittent fasting because you enjoy the satiety benefits of that, there's probably a good way to do that. And I'd say the best way to do that is probably give yourself an eight hour feeding win- window. Um, based on this other study about breakfast omission, it's probably a good idea to eat before you train. So if you have an eight hour feeding window, and you believe that this refractory period after protein feedings is is worth your time to worry about, which is debatable, mm-hmm. um, then you would have a meal. Let's say you start eating at noon. You eat at noon. You train. You eat at four. You eat at eight. You had three quality protein meals spaced four hours apart. You're fine. Mm-hmm. You're completely fine. Now, the reason I say the protein refractory thing may or may not be important, um, your tromelin has uh, has written about this extensively. He knows protein metabolism about as good as anybody. Um, that idea that you have to really worry about spacing these protein meals perfectly, a seem, it seems to be a little bit less relevant in people who do resistance training mm-hmm. because resistance training has such a robust and sustained increase in muscle protein synthesis. Yeah, I, I think that... Um, I think that this area of literature helps illustrate something that I don't think a lot of people quite get. I, I think it's something that people understand but don't actually make a point of thinking through in day-to-day life, and that is that it doesn't just matter if something seems to have a beneficial effect. You also need to keep in mind how large that effect is relative to other things that you're doing. So protein feedings absolutely increase muscle protein synthesis. I don't think anyone is going to argue with you about that, but the degree to which protein feedings increase muscle protein synthesis is dwarfed by the degree to which resistance training increases muscle protein synthesis. And so if you're wondering, you know, what's going to help me build more muscle, um, will maybe spacing protein feedings out help a little bit? Yeah, maybe, but that's kind of like a drop in the ocean compared to the effect of just lifting weights. So, you know, if you're if you're really, really focused on your protein timing, but have a stupid resistance training program, it's kind of like majoring in the minors. Or if, if the protein spacing is the thing you're obsessing about versus the thing that's actually going to give you more bang for your buck. It, it's kind of the same principle, and I think this is the illustration that's used more frequently, of... You know, the person who knows the supplement literature inside and out and takes, you know, 40 different supplements that could plausibly have a small beneficial effect on performance. And then you look at their diet and they're eating a thousand calories a day and only getting down like 80 grams of protein. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, maybe those supplements theoretically help, but they wouldn't help as much as just having a decent diet in the first place. Exactly. So to wrap this discussion up and get a little bit, uh, to get some practical applications out of it. I still think from a theoretical perspective, kind of the the default strategy, the null strategy is basically to have at least a few meals a day and kind of spread them out throughout the day. Yeah. But I think the important thing that Grant's study shows us, and again, it's one study, so no need to, to completely go nuts with it, although it is also in line with his previous study in males that were also resistant training. So it, it is starting to kind of get a little snowball rolling where there are several studies indicating that these time-restricted feeding protocols don't seem to have 
deleterious effects when it comes to muscle loss or the ability to gain muscle. Um, so it maybe they're not a hundred percent optimal for muscle accretion, but if there's any detriment, it doesn't even seem to be big enough to show up in these studies, uh, which which really makes you pause and think about how much you should worry about that. Yeah, and the the, the argument that I've seen made several times is, well, for these you know pretty normal resistance trained people in these studies, maybe it doesn't make much of a difference, but perhaps it does if someone is you know seven percent trying to get down to five percent, where you know, they're, they're going to be in a more catabolic state generally. And so maybe for them, it does make more sense to spike MPS more frequently. And to that, I would say, maybe, I mean, we don't have research on it. And that is, that one applies to such a small percentage of the population. And two applies for such a small percentage of the time in that small percentage of the population that like, yeah, maybe if you want to be a little bit more neurotic about protein timing when you're four weeks out from a show, cool. But that doesn't give you license to A, you yourself be super neurotic neurotic about it all the time, and B, to try to make other people neurotic about it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we've chatted about this, but I did intermittent fasting during a bodybuilding prep. Yeah. Um, I prepped in... 2013 i think and i mean it was fine man like in terms of lean mass it, i had the same amount of lean mass i believe as when i got my pro card four years later um and i was damn close to a pro card in 2013 uh the first show i did i, I won it by a mile but we were one competitor short of being able to give out a wnbf pro card i was pretty devastated <laughs> yeah i mean i, I i'm and, not and so like i'm not saying that it makes yeah. a difference in that circumstance i'm saying if that was an argument someone made yeah yeah then i was just trying to make clear that that would still only apply in a very special circumstance and a very small percentage of people yeah no i and and i i totally agree with that but it is kind of unique that like i did it <laughs> like I, I i tried that exact thing and was it ideal I don't know, but it was close enough to get the job done. Mm -hmm. I think that the reason that I sucked at that prep was I was doing way too much really high intensity interval training. I just trained myself into the dirt. But I the mean, intermittent that, fasting that was, was 2013. That's when everyone was doing too much high intensity. <laughs> I just I just exposed myself <laughs> as being a complete trend follower. Yeah, in 2013, the entire fitness industry was just like had cortisol pouring out of our ears because we were doing hit like four times we, a day. We, we were trying to figure out what the most ridiculous exercise you could possibly do and still call it a Tabata was. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Those are bad times. And and, and to, to get an idea of how much it scarred me. So 2013, I was doing hit on like a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely killing myself hit. The next time I prepped, I did no cardio of any type. I was like, I'm never doing that again. I'm out. <laughs> Uh, the only cardio I did was I walked to work in the morning. I walked home at night. But um, but in any case, like I, I, I've done normal feeding window preps. I've done time restricted feeding windows. Um, I'm by no means a a pusher of time restricted feeding. I've never advocated it to anybody, but I have taken it to the most extreme place you would want to take it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was optimal, but it was definitely fine. And I yeah. think that's the one thing that Grant's new study can can kind of give us data to support. Yeah. Um, in a less extreme application, obviously. Now, um, the, the the if you are to apply it, I still think it's a good idea to have multiple meals, two or three. You can mm -hmm. easily fit that in an eight hour eight hour feeding window. It's probably a good idea to eat something before you train. Um, some people can adapt quite well to fasted training. And it's not that big of a deal to them, but I think the the generalized broad recommendation would probably be that you want you want to eat something before mm -hmm. you train. Um, anything to add on time restricted feeding? Uh, I I think one of the reasons why it did get so popular in the first place 
Um, I think one of the reasons it got so popular in the first place is that a lot of people don't just don't want to have to deal with breakfast in the morning. Um, so I'm speaking for myself here. I practice time restricted feeding. Um, and the biggest reason why for me personally is I have a pretty extreme late chronotype and people with late chronotypes tend to wake up feeling groggy and not particularly hungry and we just want to we just want to do what we have to do to get some caffeine in our system and start our day and the more things that have to be added to our morning routine the more we hate life and so when i heard like oh you can skip breakfast and you'll be fine that was a godsend to me yeah uh, and <laughs> i mean so for for me and i think for a lot of people with late chronotypes uh, it just meshes with our personal preferences. And and I think that that... I think time-restricted feeding is the type of deal where if there is a benefit to it, it's that it helps you just naturally consume fewer calories. But I think the biggest benefit for most of the people who uh, regularly practice it is just that it meshes with the type of lifestyle they would want to have more. So for me... I hate breakfast. I love breakfast food, but I don't want to eat first thing in the morning. And so for me, it makes a lot of sense. If you're someone who wakes up and you love everything about eating breakfast, that's part of your morning ritual. You have an earlier chronotype, so you wake up feeling good. And that's like the type of thing that gets your day off to a good start. Probably not for you. Yeah. And I just want to, for the record, state that you claiming to have a late chronotype is the most egregious understatement <laughs> <laughs> that I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> I mean, so Greg and I live down the street from each other, essentially. So I know his day-to-day -day schedule. And if he ever messages me at eight in the morning, it, it's nighttime. Yeah. It, eight in the morning means Greg hasn't gone to bed yet. It doesn't mean he's up and at it. <laughs> now, th that is not, that's bad. I shouldn't do that as often <laughs> as I do. Um, but but for me, like the, the daily schedule that I legitimately feel best on, uh, and, and I've spent enough of my life working online that, I, that I've been able to experiment with, uh, with different schedules. What I legitimately feel best doing is going to bed at three or four and waking up at noon or one. Yeah. Uh, and, and like I have... Um, I've, I've taken months where I go to bed at or before midnight, wake up early in the morning. Like, I've given myself time to theoretically be able to acclimate to an earlier schedule. I just feel like trash the whole time. And even if I'm sleeping, well, well one, it's harder to fall asleep. And then if I am still sleeping, you know, eight, nine hours a night, if if I'm habitually sleeping nine hours a night from say, 11 p.m. to 8 a.m., if I have a day that I don't have to set an alarm, I'm so sleep-deprived, I sleep, like, 12 or 13 hours. Like, I just get dog shit sleep if I sleep <laughs> at normal times. Um, but, yeah, I mean, but I don't promote that to people because I, I understand that I'm on a pretty far extreme end of that spectrum. Yeah. That's not encouragement from the podcast. That's no. just... Uh... A sobering tale. Um, all right. So to play us out for this episode, we are going to do something new. We're going to reach into the Stronger by Science mailbag and pull out a question from a listener. Um, the question is from M.W. Stinson. You've written pretty extensively about what would be good approaches for training for beginners. But what would you say are mistakes that some coaches make when working with beginner recreational lifters? So, so that's a really good question. Um, I, I picked it specifically, so I know it's a good question. Yeah, great job, Greg. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, and, and good job, M.W. Stinson. Um, but yeah, so there are a few mistakes people make when training beginner recreational lifters, some of which are specific to beginner lifters and some of which are just mistakes that a lot of trainers make with a lot of lifters. So the first thing, and this is a pretty general one, is way too many trainers don't pay enough attention to what their 
client actually wants to accomplish. Um, a lot of trainers have a particular type of thing they like to train people for. Like maybe you're the powerlifting guy, maybe you're the bodybuilding guy, maybe you're the Olympic lifting guy. Like the, the people have their thing that they like to do. And it's nice and it's easy if someone's goals line up with the type of training you like to prescribe to someone. But you need to make sure that that you're not just training people for what you want them to accomplish versus what they actually want to accomplish. So if someone comes to you and they say, like, you know, I want to be a bodybuilder, I want to get big and shredded and, like, aesthetic and other bodybuilding words thick 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 solid tight tight yeah, yeah. symmetrical um you know if they come to you and those are their goals and you say all right we're gonna squat bench and deadlift three times a week that may not be horrible training for what they want to accomplish but that is not perfectly in line with what they are trying to accomplish that's not what they're hiring you for they're not hiring you to make them a power lifter um and so, yeah, I, I see a lot of coaches who get kind of complacent and they have a system they like to put all of their clients through, which if you have like a sports performance facility and you're doing group training, like maybe that's what you have to do. But if we're talking one-on-one -on -one personal training, it should be much, much more tailored to the individual client and what they're actually trying to accomplish versus the type of training you personally prefer. Um Another mistake a lot of people make very early in the process is they give new lifters too much too soon. So it's hard for it's hard for people like us who've been training for 10, 15 plus years to remember what it was like your first day in the gym and <laughs> to, to not be a complete masochist yet. Um, so like at this point, if I have a hard workout and it's, you know, m maybe I do some lifts that I've grown unaccustomed to and I wake up the next day and my hamstrings are so sore I can barely walk and to ambulate about my day, I have to walk like a duck or something. I think that's awesome. Right. I love that. <laughs> if someone isn't into lifting, it's their first day in the gym. They don't want to be that sore and that's going to scare them away. Because if they, if, 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 if they do come back for their second workout and you tell them like, ah, it's fine. Like you won't get sore like this all the time. One, they have no idea that you're telling them the truth. They, they have not experienced their 10th workout. They've only experienced their first workout. And second, they apparently had some level of trust in you to put them through their first workout in the first place. And whether you realize it or not, you have done something to betray their trust. Most people are trying to to feel better from working out, and you just made them feel way worse. Um, and so th there's some research on what it takes to uh, acclimate people to lifting to the point that they're not going to get crazy severe doms when you actually put them through a challenging workout. And it turns out it doesn't take very much. Um, like I think I've seen the, I think what I've seen used several times in the research is something like 30 to 40% of a one rep max for a couple sets of 10, which we're, we're talking super, super easy training. Yeah. So the first, the first time you put a muscle group for a new lifter through a workout, it should be super simple. Um, and, and just by having one or two quite easy sessions, then when you start ramping things up, they will probably get sore, but not life-destroying sore. Um, so that's number two. Number three is um, just loading people way too much before establishing basic motor skills. I do think that people can go the opposite direction of you know playing with kid gloves with a new client for too long and... You know, they've been, you're stringing them along for three or four months before you actually have them do real training. That's probably overboard for most people, but 
the opposite applies as well. Um, if you haven't established that, say, they can actually control their body weight through a squat, do it with pretty good form, maybe have a pretty decent looking kettlebell squat. Like, if you don't take the time to make sure they have those basic motor skills, and if they don't spend a little time to establish those basic motor skills before putting a barbell on their back and actually loading them heavy, um, you'll probably get away with it more often than not, honestly, because humans aren't brittle. We're not made of glass. Most people are pretty robust. But you are probably unnecessarily increasing injury risk um, that could be avoided by, you know, just taking 30 minutes to check, oh, can this person actually control their body through the positions I want to load them through? Uh, and if not, you know, just taking a week or two to make sure you establish those basic motor skills. Um, in a similar vein, a mistake I also see a lot is introducing people to too complex of movements really early on. So here I primarily have uh, weightlifting variants in mind. And if someone wants to be a weightlifter, if they come to you and they say, I want to be a weightlifter, like, okay, you should probably start doing technique work with a broomstick or a PVC pretty early on with that individual. But if someone doesn't want to be a weightlifter, one, you probably don't ever need to do weightlifting movements with them. Uh, and two, if you do, th there's a lot of low-hanging fruit you can pick before needing to dedicate a substantial amount of time to teaching people those lifts before they can actually benefit from them. So if someone's if someone's good at cleans or good at snatches, I absolutely think that those can be movements that are used well to develop velocity, develop power in those athletes. But it takes a pretty decent time, a pretty decent amount of time before someone gets good enough at weightlifting movements for you to be able to load them heavy enough that it's actually going to have much of a training effect. So that's definitely not something that most non-weightlifter, and, and probably non-crossfitter as well, because, you know, probably a fifth of CrossFit is weightlifting. But if someone's not a weightlifter or CrossFitter, you, you don't need to get them into Olympic lifting probably ever, and certainly not super early on in, in their training life. Um, another, another mistake that I see a lot of people make... Um, once they have established basic motor skills with people and you've gotten to gotten them to the point that you can start loading them is is being too conservative with load progressions so here the amount of trust that your client has in you is really important um so again it can be hard to put yourself in the shoes of someone who you know at this point has maybe been lifting a month uh, you know, you've been lifting 10, 15 years. You don't think twice about throwing heavy weight on the bar to squat or deadlift. That's not something that scares you. Maybe you get a little bit nervous for a PR attempt, but you know, you've hit a lot of PRs in your day. Um, but if someone's still pretty new to lifting, going up in weight week to week and doing something they've never done before in the weight room, that can still be scary and intimidating. So you need to, one, be able to convince them that, yes, I, you can put more weight on the bar. And then also, this is something I talk about a lot. I think a lot of people conceive of coaching as, can you write good programs? And there's way more that goes into coaching than that. Like, I would say 80% of coaching is soft skills. And being able to get buy-in from your clients, from your athletes, to when you say, like, hey, let's go up and wait. Uh, you can, one convince them that yes you're you're good for this and they trust you to let to let you put more weight on the bar um and i think that yeah i think a lot of trainers maybe focus a little too much on keeping their clients comfortable versus actually kind of nudging them towards train types of training and amounts of loading that's going to be beneficial for them and then the last thing, and this one is huge, and it, it relates to soft skills. If you're dealing with a completely novice lifter, the number one tool in your toolkit is positive reinforcement. Uh, again, 
you may not remember how nervous you were the first time in the weight room, maybe how insecure you were, because you know you're probably not good at any of the lifts you're doing, and there's a bunch of people around you who are way better. They probably aren't even looking at you, but you think that they are, and it can just be... It can be a a nerve-wracking experience for a lot of people, and one of your main jobs is to instill confidence in your client and figure out ways that you can correct them and teach them while still being overwhelmingly positive. Um, I'm aware of the research that says, you know, too much positive reinforcement can be a bad thing. Um... And I think that that applies for, you know, like intermediate level lifters. Maybe they need some tough love. You you can't compliment them on good form every single set because then it ceases to be a compliment on good form. But if someone has been training for, you know, fewer than three to six months, anything that is good that you can conceivably compliment them on, do it. Be as positive as possible. Positive reinforcement. Huge, huge, huge uh, for training new lifters. And on that positive note, I think it's time to end the episode. We want to thank everyone for listening. Now, after the music, we've got an interview with Grant Tinsley, Dr. Grant Tinsley, professor at Texas Tech. Um, Little note about that interview. We, when we were recording it, uh, at the time his wife was pregnant, I believe that they had a daughter who is now eight or nine years old. This interview has been in the can (laughs) for... For so long, <laughs> we've been sitting on this interview forever. So we, we talk about a whole bunch of his research. It, it predates, uh, it, it, we, were, we had the interview before his most recent study had even come out yet. Um, but in any case, we, we talked to him about all sorts of research he's done in the past, including some on time-restricted feeding. It's a terrific interview. So stay tuned after the music, and we'll see you next time. All right, welcome to the Stronger by Science podcast. This is Eric Trexler, the Director of Education at Stronger by Science. And today I'm joined by Greg Knuckles. And today we are very lucky to have a guest named Dr. Grant Tinsley. Uh, Grant is a, he's an assistant professor at Texas Tech University. Um, He does all sorts of body composition, exercise, diet research there. So first of all, Grant, thank you for joining us. No problem. I'm happy to be chatting with you guys today. So Grant and I have met in person at the ISSN conference a few years ago, and uh, kind of as part of introducing you to the audience, um, our first first interaction made me very upset um, (laughs) because I was sitting with Grant, uh, we're like waiting for a talk to start, and he's mentioning all these things. He's like, well, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, put a gym together in the house and you know, got the wife and kids back home, excited to be back. And, you know, it's tough being a, you know, tenure track professor. And then I found out how old he was. And I was so pissed off and felt so useless as a human being. So Grant, can you uh, give us a little idea of your background and then timestamp it to make (laughs) us all very upset at how much you've accomplished so young? Um, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't expecting that, that commentary. But uh, yeah, sorry for that. I'm glad that you, you know, decided to have me on the podcast nonetheless. But Um, Yeah, I guess I got a little ahead on the traditional um, track of things, uh, probably because I was uh, a homeschooler. I was was homeschooled all my life. So uh, because of that, I was able to start taking some college courses uh, when I was 15, just kind of knocking out some uh, general education credits and and all of that. So um, I think I had around 50 credit hours or so when I started at Oklahoma State University around 17. So I stayed there a normal four years. I got degrees there in physiology and nutritional sciences and, and had kind of a normal, um, what I would view as a normal college experience. Um, after that, I went and did a, a one-year master's program in biomedical sciences at Colorado State University. Um, so I guess kind of made up a year there. Um, and from there, went on to, to Baylor University and did my doctorate in kinesiology and exercise nutrition. Um, so I'm trying to think, I think I was, I guess, 24 I think 24 when I accepted the position at Texas Tech, possibly turning 25. Um, so yeah, now I, I'm just uh, am wrapping up my third year at Texas Tech, and um, yeah, I'm 28 now. Like you mentioned, have a 
uh, a wife and an almost two year old and a, another one on the way. So I'm kind of like you mentioned, I guess, fully into adult life now. Yeah. Well, congratulations. I didn't know you had another one on the way. Yeah, we do. It's uh, exciting times. Awesome. So yeah, I always like to make sure that the audience likes me more than the guests. So I try to start out by making you seem like a jerk for accomplishing so much. Um, now, now, right now, what would you say that like the majority of your research is focusing on? Yeah. So, I mean, I think you correctly identified it. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in human body composition, sort of the, the full spectrum from physique athletes up to individuals with, um, say, obesity or sarcopenic obesity. I've done more on the athletic side for sure, but um, I'm interested in, in body composition in and of itself. I'm interested in um, how we can accurately assess body composition, whether those are kind of evaluating longstanding techniques in new ways or looking at novel methods. Um, and then, of course, actual you know modulation or changing body composition, largely increasing lean mass or, or decreasing fat mass. So um, lots of issues kind of tangentially related to human body composition. So being someone who studies body composition, if I were to ask you to tell me your body fat percentage, you don't have to give me a number. I'm not putting you on the spot, but how would you, knowing what you know, how would you go about obtaining the one true value for your body fat percentage? Yeah. So I, that's a great question. I'll start with a caveat that um, unless I was willing to give my life in pursuit of this number, knowing this number, uh, there's no way I can know my true, true body fat percentage uh, as a living human being at this point. Um, with that said, if, you know, I were, um, again, not, not donating my, my body as a cadaver or anything like that, um, what I would do would be to, to go to the lab um, to build what we call a, a multi-compartment model or a four-compartment model um, in this case with, with really strict standardization. And, and I can explain the four-compartment model in a minute. Um, I would do that uh, likely a couple times in a row, um, ideally maybe even like three days in a row back to back if I'm being very, you know, like extra precise here. I would take some other individual measurements and kind of look at all the data and interpret it holistically. Um, and I think there are ways to do this even without the advanced methods. But um, in a, a perfect world, how you do this would be um, ideally four compartment model. So this would involve assessments via probably air displacement plethysmography or underwater weighing to um, get an estimate of my body volume, I would get an so estimate. so bod pod or yes, underwater yeah, weighing. Yeah, sorry, bod pod or underwater weighing. Um, so an estimate of my the three dimensional volume of my body, uh, my body mass on a calibrated scale, uh, an estimate of body water. Um, ideally, you do this through uh, some advanced techniques like a dilution technique, but this would take several hours. So practically in the lab, we'll often use. Um, bioimpedance spectroscopy. So this is a technique um, similar to uh, a more advanced version of what you'd see even in, in body fat scales or the little handheld body fat devices. Um, BIS is just a little more advanced way to do that, but you can get an estimate of body water. Uh, and then I would do a DEXA scan to get my bone mass. And you can essentially plug those components, so body volume, body mass, uh, body water, and bone, plug those into an equation. Um, and essentially, you've taken a lot of things into account when you finally get this body fat percentage. Um, so that's what I do under very strict standardization. So overnight food and fluid fast, um, rested, et cetera. Again, the, in a perfect world, I do this maybe a few days back to back and average my measurements. So one of my questions that I like to ask body comp researchers that put them on the spot is, do you think body comp tests are, are actually useful at the individual level? Or do you think their main utility is looking at kind of group level changes that smooth out the the error that they're prone to? Yeah, <laughs> another great question. You clearly know this, and the way you ask this question demonstrates that, that uh, for all techniques, error at the individual level is much higher than error at the group level. So like you said, at the group level, the individuals who are overestimated, say in body fat by, by a given technique, um, will balance out to some extent with individuals who are underestimated. Um, with that said, I think there is some utility to tracking body composition changes in an individual. You just need to interpret them cautiously, um, and I would say holistically, so interpret them in the context of, of other metrics that aren't even related to, to body composition directly, um, things like nutritional intake, performance, etc. cetera. Um, would you like me to kind of give a recommended practical method for 
how I would do that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I- I'm all ears. Yeah. So, so practically, and you know, as I talked about the multi compartment model, m- most of us, many many people, um, you know, listening to this won't won't have access to all this equipment, um, and, and won't be able to do testing that way. So, in sort of a more practical scenario, and given the fact that many body composition techniques have really large errors at the individual level. Um, what I would personally do in that scenario, um, again, strict standardization, the odds are stacked against you if you're measuring body composition, composition in an individual already. So you want to minimize any errors you can. So when I say standardize overnight food and fluid fast, if you're taking a body mass measurement, your scale at home, um, ideally nude body weight, um, you've avoided your bladder, uh, even considered your bowel movements if you're regular. I mean, a- as standardized as you can be. So body mass. Um, then what I would do personally is take both uh, circumference measurements and skin fold estimates at kind of major sites on the body. And I'd interpret those cautiously, but you can infer some things from those. So for example, um, if you are in a period of your training where you're trying to uh, gain muscle, and you're taking um, estimates on your thigh, for example. If you see that your thigh circumference, um, you know, measuring this to the, the best of your ability at the exact same location, after the same standardization, all that, if you see that your thigh circumference is increasing and you're seeing no change in the raw skin fold thickness um, at that location, you could cautiously interpret that as you're gaining uh, muscle mass in your thigh uh, without necessarily gaining um, subcutaneous fat in your thigh. So I would interpret those raw circumferences with the raw skin fold estimates, also considering body mass and um, thinking about things like your your performance in the gym, what you're seeing and your nutritional intake so that you don't freak out and change something dramatically in your programming just because you have a day where your measurements seem to be moving in the wrong direction. Now, you mentioned uh, doing this maybe a few days in a row if possible, uh, especially when looking at like a 4C model. How do you factor in, um, or, or should you factor in the phase of menstrual cycle uh, for women? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you should um, factor that in. So probably with any assessment method, the ideal thing, um, if there is a regular menstrual cycle you can base this off of, off of would be to do the measurements um, at the same phase in the menstrual cycle. So whether that's a certain um, number of days you know, past the onset of menstrual bleeding or however you want to quantify that. Um, You know, as you know, that can be more difficult if you're talking about physique athletes, if uh, you're dealing with an athlete who hasn't had a a cycle in a long period of time, you know, you don't know exactly if there are any um, variations in body fluids that that aren't corresponding to an obvious phase in the menstrual cycle. But yeah, for someone with a regular menstrual cycle, I would say that's another thing you can standardize. So standardize everything, just reduce any errors that you can. So if I was, you know, person in the general population who didn't live right next to a big lab and I could only have access to bod pod or DEXA or BI, you know, only one of the common methods out there, which one would you direct me to? Or would you maybe even just say, maybe don't bother? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, will this testing be free for this person or not? <laughs> um, historically not yeah. free. I mean, usually I, I haven't looked into it because I've kind of always been in the lab, but I, Greg, do you have any idea how much body comp assessment typically ta- uh, costs? Um, so t- typically you can get skin folds done by a trainer in a gym somewhere. Uh, tell them you're interested in, in signing up for their services and that will be part of maybe like the, the free thing that they would provide to entice you to sign up. So you, you can probably get that done for free. Um, BIS uh is dirt cheap like you can probably buy one of the devices for yourself for like 20 bucks maybe 30 um i think if you want to get like a dexa or bod pod done though typically you're going to be paying between 75 and 100 bucks yeah um yeah so in in the context of that what i would recommend would probably still be doing the more practical method if you want to do that you know even monthly you could so the the raw circumferences, raw skin folds, um, strict body weight. And then if, if you want more detailed information, um, so for example, if you want a look at regional body comp and you're just a little skeptical of the circumference and skin fold method or something like that, I don't think it'd be wrong, of course, to um, pay for DEXA over every so often. I definitely don't think, or a bod pod, I don't think you should be doing that 
um, every month. Uh, as you guys know, and likely listeners know, um, an advantage of DEX in the scenario would be the regional body composition output. Whereas something like um, BOD pod and most, but not all impedance devices would be that they, they just give you whole body output. Um, you know, so it might be interesting to see like, okay, you know, my body fat apparently has decreased or maybe my fat free mass has increased. Um, but without any regional information, some people in the physique athlete realm who are really interested in, in knowing as much as possible and fine tuning their training, that, that may not be enough information for them. So even if you do do the more advanced testing and choose to pay, I'd recommend doing kind of the practical testing on your own. Um, in, in Greg, since you mentioned having a, a trainer do the skin folds, I think the ideal scenario here would be to have like a, a either life partner or gym partner or someone who is kind of willing to put in the time like you two uh, or a small group uh, practice on each other, get uh, to the point where you're sure you're getting reliable estimates. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this as well, but but you can have skinfold measurements by someone who's moderately trained or, or who seems like they should be able to have reliable measurements. Um, but then if you look at how they're actually conducted or look at the output, you, you know, they're just vastly off. So you'd want to standardize who's taking the measurements. You definitely wouldn't want trainer A taking the measurements one month and then, you know, they leave the gym or something like that. And a few months down the road, you're getting the new trainer who came in taking your measurements. Um, so when I say standardize everything, ideally you're having the same person take the circumferences for you if you're not able to do them, the same person doing the skin folds for you, et cetera. So um, that, that would sort of be my recommendation on that point. That's a really good point that I often forget to make when talking about this stuff. But like, man, skin fold quality varies. Like uh, Malia, M Malia Blue is in my old lab. She's published under the name Malia Melvin as well before she got married. But like... I've always been convinced her skin fold measurements should be the, the official gold standard in the literature <laughs> and all, all other devices are just trying to catch up to her skin folds. Like she was like a wizard with the calipers. But I mean, every now and then, like, especially like in just a lab of kids trying to like learn it or whatever, you get some wacky numbers. So the training and the consistency of who's doing it with skin folds is huge. And you are kind of telling me a lot of what Bill Campbell has told me kind of just in our conversations, which we're kind of like, whether or not you want to put a body fat number on it is up to you. But he and I are kind of of the thought, like if you have either calipers or an ultrasound and you're monitoring, you know, fat thickness throughout a weight loss phase or a contest prep, like just measure what you're trying to make inferences about. And that's just the fat thickness, you know? Yeah. So if you want to like plug it into some regression based equation that may or may not be good for you, that's fine. And you can get a number and say, hey, I'm 9% body fat. But really what we're looking at is, did your, do you have less fat between the skin and muscle than you used to? So it, it really, I mean, like you're saying, it doesn't have to get too much more complicated than that at the individual level. Now, before we move on, I do have one question. Yeah. I saw you posted something on social media, I think, about this new 3D imaging device. What can you tell me about that? Because like, I, I knew there would be a day where I had been out of the lab game for long enough that the world would pass me by, <laughs> but I thought it would take more than four months. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm already like, what the hell's going on in there? So what what is this 3D imaging body comp device? Yeah, no. Um that's a great question. I'm happy to talk about that. We actually have four different devices in my lab that are these infrared 3D scanners. So um, to the best of my understanding, these were first developed in the mid 1980s. Um, these infrared three dimensional um, scanners, essentially the purpose of these scanners is to build um, a three dimensional avatar of the human body. So the original purpose in these being developed was kind of um, from the fashion merchandising realm. Um, in my understanding is for like custom fit of clothing. Um, I know a graduate student in our area who worked at Disney one summer and they, they use one of these 3d scanners to scan him. So he'd have kind of the custom fit, um, uniform or costume for the performances at Disney. So th that's kind of the background that came from in the last five to 10 years, they've started to slowly emerge and, and more recently within the last couple of years, um, as a method for body composition estimation. So in terms of what these devices are actually like. Um, three of the four scanners in my lab have a rotating platform that a participant will stand on. Uh, the participant will be clothed similarly to um, what they would do for BOD pod. So 
minimal form fitting clothing. Um, we have individuals in swim caps. Um, so they're standing there just, you know, with their body, the, they get rotated around. Uh, and there are a few different technologies, but essentially, um, infrared light is, is captured and uh, a point cloud is built, which is kind of a three dimensional representation of the participant's body um, with these kind of X, Y, Z points. And, and these are all meshed together. So you eventually get an avatar. So like you can drag this around, rotate in three dimensions, and, and this is someone's body. Um, kind of a, a funny side note is one of the students in my lab was just presenting some preliminary research from these 3D scanners at a conference. And he actually had a friend of his uh, in the engineering department 3D print one of his own avatars. So at the conference, he had kind of an action figure of his own body uh, that his, he was able to pass around to people who came uh, to his poster. Um, so anyway, and so I mean, I would, I was, I would imagine that ultimately the end game past costume making is that you do the three, the three D printing, and you wait for artificial intelligence to pick up, and then we merge that, and it's pretty much all over, right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, that's probably where we're headed. Cool. Um, well, thanks for contributing to that. I'm yeah, glad you're doing that in your lab. I'm just hoping to be on the right side of history here. You know. Yeah, I welcome the the AI people that will rule us. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think they're great. Um, yeah, so so you have these three D avatars, and what I've described so far, even in a small amount of detail, probably sounds pr kind of techy, and it, they look very cool. Um, but at the end of the day, as of now, these are essentially really fancy tape measures, really expensive tape measures, um, because most of the companies producing these devices, and they're around half a dozen right now, they're using them for body composition applications. Um, most of them are just using circumference-based equations. So you essentially have like the army body fat equation. Um, you just have a really fancy digital tape measure. And admittedly, they it's a little bit of mixed evidence, but likely that they're more reliable for circumference estimates than, um, than a human with a flexible measuring tape, unless that human is like kind of an expert tailor. Um, but right now they're kind of circumference-based equations. Where these could go would be using total or regional body volumes to predict body composition. So if, and the companies aren't there yet, but if, if they can nail down the total body volume, then this very quick scan could theoretically replace something like bod pod or underwater weighing, even for use in a multi-compartment model. Um, but as of now, there's one company I know of that's using a mix of circumferences and volumes of different body segments to predict body fat. Um, but we're doing some validation uh, work for them. And, and there's a lot that needs to be done before these can be viewed as a reasonable method for a standalone method for estimating body composition actually a quick side note because i know you guys might greg you might be even particularly interested in this though eric i'm sure you will too one kind of cool thing we can do though is it, it gives us so many anthropometric measurements that um i have a biomechanist colleague in my department who's doing a really interesting um, deadlift study right now and we're scanning everyone with this three scanner as part of the study and we'll be able to look at kind of some advanced um, anthropometric predictors of deadlift performance. So there's some other kind of sports science application beyond just the the body comp realm. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah, you can get, um, I mean, can you get down to like potentially superficial bony markers or are you looking at just like lever lengths there with just kind of, kind of gross estimates? Probably more gross estimates at this point. Um, I need to look into it a little bit on the processing. The output's crazy, the amount. Um, of output you get from this, but there's some regions that are much easier to identify. Things like the crotch and the armpit are pretty easy to um, for the automated software to identify. Um, landmarks are a little, you can do that, might be a little bit um, trickier. So that's something we'll have to look at as we get into the analysis on that that project. Yeah, I, mean, I would imagine anything beyond like the patella or, you know, real protru protrusions in the ankle or something like that would probably be pretty tough. Yeah, but uh, no, that's really cool. And I would imagine there's maybe something down the road there where where we can get more information about different um, patterns of fat storage and kind of how those predict body fat as well. You know Absolutely. What I mean? Once you get into three dimensional kind of imaging. Absolutely. And they're, they're actually two big NIH uh, studies looking at that and they're trying to develop body phenotypes beyond like the apple shape and pear shape and seeing whether unique health risks associated with certain phenotypes. Well, we're going to need more fruits. Yeah. Interesting. Going to have a whole fruit system. I, uh, I identify my body shape as, uh, as kumquat shaped. Inter Ooh, interestingly kumquat. enough. It's <laughs> a good one. Do you mind if I use that? Can I introduce that term into the scientific literature? Yeah. The, the kumquat shaped body or like dragon fruit, like a bunch of weird little protrusions. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> 
this I, I'm I so lack um, class and sophistication with my eating, and Greg will attest to this. I don't even know what any of those fruits are shaped like, yeah. uh, fruits or vegetables. I'm, I'm I have no idea. We, Greg and I always have dinner every every Sunday night, and he'll make this like super elaborate thing I've never heard of. And he'll be like, what'd you bring, Eric? And I'm like, shredded chicken again. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a, a kumquat is just a very, very small citrus fruit. Um, and you eat it with the skin on. Weird. Yeah. Is it round? Uh, it's it's ovaloid. <laughs> ovaloid. Yeah, it's, it's shaped, yeah, okay, it's shaped yeah, like it. me. It's shaped like me. You without the limbs, I assume? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's it's less that it's less that a kumquat describes my current body shape and more that it uh describes the body shape to which I aspire. Well, that's good. I mean, setting goals is huge and <laughs> the more specific the better. Um, you know, the, the old SMART goal acronym, specificity is key. I was trying to think of a fruit that would be very flattering and I found out in the process of thinking my fruit um library is limited if it's not an apple or an orange or a banana dude easy peasy it's a it's a butternut squash oh yeah i feel like that would be a flattering one for women at least sure because it would be like (laughs) shoulders wider than the waist and then big hips like you know i i feel like that's it's something that wouldn't necessarily be a good compliment now because we haven't raised awareness yet but one of these days, you're thicker than a bowl of oatmeal is going to be replaced by your body resembles a butternut squash. Like that's going <laughs> to that's gonna make people just melt. Well, you know, we set out to do the podcast to leave a legacy. You know, it's not, <laughs> to, it, you know, this isn't some get rich quick scheme. It's to leave a mark on the zeitgeist and, and to kind of ensure that when we're dead, the names live on. And so if, if that's what we contribute, then that's what we contribute. Hell yeah. And Grant, I'm I'm happy to rope you in on this. Um, you know, you're kind of there in spirit, so we'll probably, you know, give you most of the credit for that really stupid idea. I'm I'm happy to take the credit for that idea. That'll that'll come up in your tenure review and you'll be looking for a new job. I'm actually updating my C V as we speak right now to include this. Yeah. So before we move away from body comp, I have one last kind of it's two questions in one. Um so the only research that matters is the research done on physique athletes. And we all know this and Greg pretends it's not true, but he's wrong. So you've done a few studies um, on physique athletes, but you did a couple where you look specifically at measuring and predicting their resting metabolic rate and also looking at their fat-free mass characteristics compared to others. So these are kind of two separate studies. So I guess my question is, why did you look into these characteristics? Like, like what kind of made you think this requires a specific look versus just assuming they're normal ish? Yeah. So I guess to start with the resting metabolic rate, um, honestly, I think the seeds of this idea were probably planted in my mind as you look at uh, the many sites now where you can calculate your Um, recommended calorie intake in your macros, et cetera. Uh, And they'll often, uh, or many of them will have kind of a note about which um, resting metabolic rate equation they're using and then you'll factor in your activity level and so on and so forth. And I was noticing many of them use these equations that have been around for 50 to 100 years. Um, And when you look back at these, the papers where these equations were actually developed, um, they're developed in the general population Um, Some of them even specifically excluded athletes. So, you know, as I'm thinking about that and thinking about either a physique athlete or an aspiring physique athlete um, who's trying to get an estimate of their um, calorie intake needs, say, for weight maintenance so that they can, you know, then enter a a fat loss phase or um, muscle gain phase or, you know, whatever it would be. I was just kind of wondering if you're even starting at an accurate point at all. And, of course, you know, then there should be some monitoring and adjusting and you'll hopefully if you're tracking well, find out whether or not that initial estimate was appropriate. So anyways, I was kind of thinking about that. And then recently in um, 2014, I believe, uh, Ten Half and and his colleagues developed a a nice generalized equation for athletes. So they took a bunch of different athletes from all kinds of different sports and built, uh, they essentially examined the existing methods, kind of like the ones you see pop up in calculators 
and found that those weren't really accurate in these active individuals and they developed their own equations. Um, so that was great, but you had all types of athletes and very different training practices, shapes and sizes, body compositions, et cetera. Um, so I was interested in taking a different approach and looking specifically at um, more or less off-season physique athletes and, and looking at whether these um, equations held up both body mass-based equations and fat-free mass-based equations. Um, since, you know, the, the proportion of body mass that's fat-free mass in a physique athlete is, you know, potentially different, definitely than the general population and even than athletes in other sports. So um, that's kind well, of you where this started. So. Yeah, you would hope so. Um, that's kind of where this started. Um, in, in big picture, what we found is that virtually all the existing body mass and fat-free mass-based equations um, – body mass based equations in particular dramatically underestimated uh, resting metabolic rate, particularly in male physique athletes, but um, most of them in female physique athletes as well. Uh, we also looked at a couple portable indirect calorimeters. So if you didn't have a metabolic cart in a lab where you could have your resting metabolism tests, we were trying to validate some of these portable methods that, um, you know, could be taken. And I know, um, you know, Eric, you've done some mobile data collection before. So, you know, something that you can have uh, that you can take to different locations and not have everyone travel into your lab. So, so we looked at those as well. But ultimately, the point was to, um, if necessary, and we deemed that it was necessary, develop a preliminary um, body mass-based equation and fat-free mass-based equation for physique athletes similar to the ones that we tested. Yeah. Now, and basically, I, I believe, recalling the paper, the only one that did kind of okay was basically the Cunningham equation, right? Aside from the new ones you developed? Yeah, well, um, yeah, so the Cunningham, 1980 Cunningham equation, they developed a newer one in 91, and that one didn't perform as well. And then the 10 half equation, which was developed in active individuals did pretty well, at least their fat free mass based equation. But um, the funny thing about the Cunningham equation, it did do pretty well, but I think it was um, serendipitous, because they excluded um, active individuals when they develop their equation. And then um, for their fat-free mass-based equation, they didn't have a, a body comp technique. They just estimated fat-free mass based on, I, I believe it was just body mass and age. So, I mean, they were just kind of, you know, guessing at fat-free mass and excluding active individuals, but somehow it ended up turning out to be like a decent prediction equation for physique athletes. Um, so I think it was, it was kind of, you know, serendipitous that that, that one was uh, fairly accurate. Yeah, Greg and I were talking about that a few weeks ago, where they're, they're, it's like, you kind of forget where these equations come from, based on once they kind of enter the use, that they're just a thing now, you don't think like, oh, that pertains to, you know, 30 to 40 year old females in a particular region, yeah. you know, it's just once it's an equation, it's out there, and you can just use it. Um, but yeah, it, it is kind of funny when you look back at an equation and you associate it with where you've seen it generalized. And then you look back to where it came from and you're like, why would it make sense to use that in the scenario? Yeah. Um, and so like, if you haven't looked into the, the validation studies, it's like, did you really think that equation was going to be useful here? Grant, do you, do you remember the, uh, the paper looking at uh, body composition and like estimates of skeletal muscle mass in Ray Williams a few months ago? Um, I don't recall the details. I recall the existence, uh, of the paper. So, um, <laughs> one of the, uh, small bits of information in that study that generated a lot of discussion, understandably so, was that apparently Ray Williams is 24% body fat. Um, which like, do you, do you know what the guy looks like? I do. Yeah. Okay. So Greg, I, what fruit would you use to describe, uh, <laughs> Just so we can try to be objective and academic. Oh, God. Uh, I'm not going to say anything that could be even remotely <laughs> insulting because when I when I eventually meet the guy, I, I don't want him to dislike me for obvious reasons. Um, well, he, he's an absolute <clears throat> legend. So let's get that out of the oh, way. Oh, yeah, for, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, but 24% 24, 24 body fat, he is not. Um, and so th there were people discussing this and some people were like, no, like th there's no way that's right. And there were some people that's like, bro, 24% body fat just, just looks different w when someone has enough muscle mass. Like you just don't understand it, bro. And I was like, I was interested in how did they get this number in the first place? Uh, so I looked up the reference for the, uh, ultrasound based formula they used 
and it was in uh, it was a formula developed for sedentary um, middle aged Asian people. Nice. Um, which you could say many things about Ray, but he is not a middle aged sedentary Asian person. Um, so I pointed out, like, hey, this is possibly the cause of this error here if we assume there is error here uh, and people were like why did they use that formula and i was like i don't know but anyway yeah that's a good point you got to follow the references yeah i got to fact check for sure yeah and you know it's you know error it's you know it's not like they completely botched it it's just like uh maybe that's you know not the the perfect equation that might be causing some some confusion yeah i saw something recently with the i can't remember if it was at the combat or just circulating around social media some draft prospect who i can't remember had like they were saying he had i can't remember if it's two percent body fat something absurd and and you see a picture of him dk metcalf yes yeah i believe so yeah um yeah similar thing that that number gets out there and popularized and then yeah that's what it is oh yeah it, it was 1.9 percent. 1.9 yeah <laughs> that's lean that's lean <laughs> isn't uh just if you have a brain, doesn't a, doesn't the existence of a brain put you somewhere at around like 0.9 to 1.2, depending on how large you are? I think so. I like all the DEXs I've paid attention to on the brain region. It's usually like the head's 18% body fat or so. So yeah, that that would pull up the the average for the rest of the body a little bit. Sick. Yeah, I mean that's lean. But I, I don't want to brag, but um, I will. So <laughs> I did. Uh, <laughs> our ta program we have to like have the students use a, a handheld bia thing and it's fine it, you know it is what it is but um i used it in our little training thing and it was about it was a few weeks after a bodybuilding competition so i had recently gained th this was before i was even close to knowledgeable about not binging after a show and so i'd gained like 15 pounds in the last few weeks and the BIA put me at just a touch under 5%. So I usually, when people say, how lean did you get? I usually put it about one and a half percent body yeah. fat, just kind of back calculating. So, um, you know, he and I are in rarefied air with a sub 2% body fat. But if you try hard enough and you're not a baby, um, you can do it. <laughs> but the problem is most people don't want it bad enough right for sure like we do that's a that's interesting that you use um baby as an insult and a slur there uh i think <laughs> i think eric is is anti is is an anti-natalist that's that's interesting no, information no, that's, for the public to that, be aware of that's slanderous for you to say mm, that it's i, it's, I think it's I, slanderous there, for you to use baby as an insult that's true. I, I had let it fly, but now that Greg points it out, yeah. <laughs> do you care about the propagation of our species? Because it, it seems do. that you I don't. Just, I was on a plane yesterday, okay? And there was indeed a person of few years uh, behind me. <laughs> a person and of few years. A, a person of not many years. Um, <laughs> and this person was quite boisterous and disruptive and um so m maybe i'm harboring some resentment because i really would have loved a nap on that airplane um but the noise level pr precluded that so grant i know you have one on the way i'm very sorry if you want to if you want to hop off the call you can i understand <laughs> no it's all good i i it's all good w would just to validate would you say that babies complain uh or make whining related sounds more than the general population you know, I think there's a lot of individual variability. Um, honestly, my son, who's almost two, I think complains a lot less than most of the adults I interact with in general <laughs> society. Um, but that's not true of everyone. So yeah, I'd say lots of inter-individual inter variability there. Well, I can tell you this. So little known fact about me is that as a child, I had a fairly moderate case of Tourette syndrome. And uh, I was not a pleasant baby to be around. Mm. I can promise you that. It was... Uh, there's nothing I could do uh, to repay my parents for just putting up with me. So I, I apologize to them every time I see them and, and they just shake their head and say, it's, it's really not enough. <laughs> it, you, you were horrible. So, so maybe I'm just reflecting my own baby related antics. Um, so we've got Grant Tinsley on the line and you can't end a discussion with Grant without saying something about intermittent fasting. 
you did a lot of really, really good work on intermittent fasting. Um, do you have any in the works right now or have you kind of moved on toward the body composition line of research? Yeah, I do have some in the works. Um, I find it a really interesting topic. The The studies are very demanding to conduct. So that won't be my, you know, my only line of research I pursue or else I just won't be as productive as I would like to be uh, just because the, the time and effort involved for one intermittent fasting study is much greater than half a dozen methodology studies, it feels like to me. Um, so we do, we have one major one uh, in the work that's under review for publication right now. Um, it's actually a sort of a follow-up study to the uh, so-called lean gain studies uh, that we did in males. So the 16-8 the intermittent fasting, we conducted a, a data collection here at Texas Tech um, using a relatively similar protocol in females. Um, so we did this in, in resistance trained females. They were um, not at the like elite physique athlete level, but had on average about five years of uh, resistance training experience. And we did, you know, fully supervised resistance training, eight weeks of the 16, eight, um, or controlled diet. We did, you know, kind of a variety of things. there. looked at a bunch of different markers. So that's under review. Um, and that's something that I'm really excited about. I think it, uh, will provide some interesting information. We did, um, protein supplement in all the groups and had them up at a protein intake that's that's in the range that's optimal for lean mass accretion. And one of the main things we're looking at is whether or not there would be uh, any attenuation of lean mass accretion uh, with all calories consumed. And it ended up being about a seven and a half hour window each day, as opposed to about 13 and a half hours um, each day in the, the control group. So um, yeah, I'll, you know, definitely have more to say about that when it's, um, when it's published and, you know, maybe can, can chat in detail with you guys about that, but that's kind of the main one in the works. And then, you know, just cause this was a relatively, unexplored area, I've been able to get pulled in on data collections occurring at several other universities, um, kind of in these these studies of intermittent fasting and active individuals and, and whether or not this compromises adaptations or um, whether or not, you know, who it's a good strategy for, essentially. And, and now, I, I, without spilling the beans on this paper that that is forthcoming, one of the things I like to do talking to researchers who've done multiple studies on a topic is... I, you know, I don't really want you to tell me the p-value of one statistical test of one paper you did. I like to get an idea of like what is your general conclusions or you know your your working kind of operational conclusions about a particular strategy. You know, so don't tell me about one study, but you know, kind of show me the forest, not a single tree within it. So, as a person who's done multiple studies on intermittent fasting, um, if I were coming to you saying Grant. I have, you know, strength or physique related goals. Is intermittent fasting the strategy for me? Is it better than a normal eating pattern? What would you tell a person like that? Yeah, I would say it's not inherently better. I would say it's better if it's more sustainable for you. Um, and I know, you know, physique athletes in some ways are different than general population. For the general population, say for weight loss, like you I mean, it has to be something that's sustainable long term if you want weight loss and weight loss maintenance. And, um, you know, when someone in general comes to me and asks about it, it's very much in that realm of if you're interested in it, try it. If you think you could do this forever, stick to it. If not, you're not missing out. It's okay. Um, in the, the physique athlete realm, I think there's some people that just like have the, the willpower and the drive and just like will do whatever is necessary. So it, I know it's a, a little bit different population, but yeah, I would, my, my big picture answer that to that would be, um, if you don't want to, you certainly don't have to. I think there's growing evidence. It's a viable strategy and at, at least up to intermediate training levels would not inherently compromise, um, performance or lean mass adaptations. So yeah, I would view it as, as a strategy, but not the strategy and option, but you're not, um, missing out on the greatest thing ever if you don't do it. And I think there probably are some potential health benefits um, that are still being explored, uh, maybe even in isochloric situations independent of body weight or body composition changes. But but strictly from like a performance and body comp standpoint, I would view it uh, at this point very much as an option, but not the answer. Yeah, I'm kind of grateful it came along because I am lately just like the worst person on the planet and very lazy. So um I just don't feel like spending the time to eat in the morning. Yeah. And I'm at a, unfortunately a high enough body fat that I don't really get hungry anymore. 
So I just don't eat all day. And then at the end of the night, I'm like, no, this was good. I'm intermittent fasting yeah. and I'm proud of me for sticking to my plan today. Yeah. But yeah, I just, it's fine. It is what it is. Yeah, that's just kind of what I do. Do you think it's because we stay up to inappropriate times, like super late at night? Um, I don't know. For for me personally, I um, I generally have a lot to do. And so any time in the morning before I get on work, uh, it, like it, it makes me antsy, right? So if I know I have a ton of work to do, I just want to get right at it. And so I don't want to like spend the time to cook and eat because it makes me uh, at least somewhat anxious. Um, so yeah, that's probably it's it's probably a window into my psychological health that will will lead people to uh, think I'm a little bit crazy. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's I think that's probably why I do it more than anything. Um, and then once once I have like a good chunk of work done for the day, I'm like okay. Now I can take a break and eat something. And then once most of my work is done for the day, it's like, okay, now I can take another break and eat something else. And yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I, I base my meal schedule around. I was chuckling because um, I never put two and two together, but that's exactly why I do it as well. Um, I, the second I roll out of bed, I immediately begin writing and write for at least a few hours um, or at least reading. But if I don't do that, I, I'm just a mess of anxiety and antsiness. So Grant, at least when you're when you're bringing in uh, participants for your studies, be like, hey, just get busy in the morning, write an article or something and they'll love it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's true. Honestly, it's a similar pattern. I'm, you know, out of bed in the office and, you know, whether it's collecting data, writing, whatever you look up and it's midday and you've gotten kind of just absorbed in work. So, So similarly, I think it's something that's, uh, really good for certain people's schedules and lifestyles. But it'd be hard if you were just kind of like sitting around doing nothing to wait until some certain time of day. Yeah. And, and, and that, that is the thing. Like I, I very rarely take days just completely off work. Um, but the days I do, I, I tend to either make myself breakfast or like go out to brunch with Lindsay or something like that. Uh, yeah. My, so I, I intermittent intermittently fast, I would say probably, 90% of the time and just as soon as soon as I kind of break away from my normal schedule where I'm like working from the second I get out of bed uh, then it's like yeah let, let's go eat breakfast um, just <laughs> because how else are you going to spend a morning you know yeah <laughs> yeah and speaking of, of schedules one day at a different time we got to wrap up here but we need to figure out how Grant does what he does because if you look at Grant's list of publications on PubMed, which everybody should, Grant's one of the few people out there that like all of his studies are remarkably applicable to the power lifter, the bodybuilder. But Grant, all of your studies came out in the last like three years, man. Like you need to take a nap or something. This is crazy. Uh, <laughs> are you working like 90 hours a week? I don't keep track. Um, I don't think it's 90 hours a week and, and I appreciate those kind of words. No, I mean, honestly, um, I'm really thankful for the the faculty spot I'm in. We have a very reasonable teaching load. I feel like I can dedicate a lot of time and effort to research and still have a balanced life and um, spend a lot of time every day playing with my two-year-old and get to lift and, and spend time with friends and family and all that. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Just kind of in a good season. I am, I'm very into efficiency and try not to have wasted time. So I think that's uh, you know, any fat there was in my schedule definitely got trimmed out once uh, once we had uh, Titus, my son. So, um, no, I appreciate appreciate the kind words. Well, yeah, that is awesome. And keep it up, man, because every time you publish, I mean, it's like all of your papers. There's something extremely it goes right from the page to something you can apply really directly. Um, so thank you for doing what you do. Um, work a little harder if you could get out maybe 10 or 15 a year. Um, then it'd make my job a lot easier. I will do my best. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, stop doing all these podcasts. You're wasting time. I know. Man. I know. So Grant, thanks so much for coming on. Um, if our listeners want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, is there anywhere for them to do that? Yeah. So probably a um, couple places. One, I will try to post when we have just kind of interesting things going on lab or publications that come out or things like that. So um, I'm probably most active on Instagram. Um, so my handle is just Grant 
underscore Tinsley, T-I-N-S-L-E-Y underscore PhD. Um, I'm also post some of the same things to Facebook. So it's just, you know, my name, Grant Tinsley. Um, and then I have a personal website that's relatively static. It's kind of like a CV and list of publications, though I do have um, pictures of like the, the equipment, my laboratory and um, post a few resources on there. And that's just granttinsley.com. Um, so those are probably the best places to get in touch with me. Awesome. So if you're listening, go check out Grant's social media. Um, he puts out a lot of interesting stuff uh, and go read his studies because they're very good. Um, Grant, once again, we want to thank you for your time and we want to thank everyone for listening. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.